All right, medical terminology and anatomy and physiology. Uh, these two sections um, are, well, this chapter, the two sections of this chapter are fairly intensive. Uh, there's a lot of materials covered in this chapter. Um, and it's going to require some time to sit down and review. Uh, I would not expect you to master this overnight. It takes a lot of time to get a lot of this down. There is no way that in an hour or two of studying either of these topics will you have mastered either one of them. Uh, there, are at the college level, at the very basic college level, um, some allied health providers will take a one semester class on medical terminology and a one semester class on anatomy and physiology. Um, upper level uh, allied health providers take at least two semesters of anatomy and physiology. And so it's, uh, it, it's not something that you can master uh, just breezing through it in a textbook. It, it will take time. Um, and a lot of these, a lot of this stuff will be kind of frustrating because you'll be looking to try to just nail it and, and have it all committed to memory. And it just doesn't work that way particularly medical terminology, you have to start putting together rules um, and using your intuition to say, okay, well, what does this word mean? Well, it reminds me of this, and I know this is, um, okay, say, for example, appendectomy. Well, you probably know what an appendectomy is. That's when they remove your appendix. But if I said a cholecystectomy, uh, you would have to go, well, what the heck is that? Well, you know that an ectomy is something that they have removed from the body. And a coli cyst, coli has to do with bile, and cyst usually means bag or sack of. So let's see, that would be a bile bag or a gallbladder. So it's something that you can slowly work on. Um, getting the rules and, and whatnot down, and, and eventually it'll kind of come to you. So, of course, we have objectives. Um, not a lot of objectives in this chapter, but what they do cover all is pretty, uh, pretty intense, pretty heavy stuff. Now, also within your course page for this week, um, we put in there uh, Another website you can go to. It's basically a mini uh, anatomy, or not an anatomy and physiology, a mini uh, medical terminology course. There's uh, some other uh, resources in there about anatomy and physiology, as well as um, the medical terminology. Uh, one of those uh, I've got marked as, as supplemental, and uh, it would be very, very helpful for you to go to that. Uh, and at least do that one if you don't choose to use the, the medical terminology course uh, that's actually put out by Des Moines University. Um, that medical terminology course makes it look like you need to register for it, but you don't. You only need to register for it if you absolutely needed a certificate uh, saying that you had completed it. And you guys are going to really be using it as an enrichment. So that would be, uh, you know, you can, I think, use as much of it as you want. Uh, at, uh, at really no cost and without registering. So good little piece of uh, uh, information there. So if you really like either of these topics, of course, there are many, many more moons uh, of college courses you can take to help you master these. A couple multimedia videos in your regular PowerPoint, um, both medical terminology components and then some of the medical specialties uh, components. Our major concepts to tackle here are medical terminology and how these terms are constructed, various directional terms and positional terms, and then the structure and function of major body systems. Um, while there's only really four major core concepts here, uh, they're huge concepts. So we'll start with medical terminology. All right, so components of medical terms. Most of these come from an ancient language of some sort, whether that was uh, Latin or Greek. Um, some of them, some of them are, are a little more modern, but a majority of them come from those ancient languages. So um, we'll have various parts of these medical terms, such as the root word, 
Um, so they give the examples pnea when with pnea, or most people don't don't pronounce the p very well, uh, meaning uh, breathing, and then arthur meaning uh, joints. So uh, that's our root word. Then they'll usually add some sort of a combining form to it. Um, so for an example of thermometer, the combining form or the combining vowel here is the O, therm uh, meaning temperature, meter meaning to measure, uh, and that's how they come up with thermometer. They may have prefixes to them that kind of are more like a, uh, in, in most cases, more like a um, adjective. So um, we go back to our friend Pena that we uh, ha saw as a root word meaning breathing, and when we add a prefix, either dyspnea or tachypnea, um, those are indicating different uh, conditions of breathing. Dys, uh, I, I like this one, this one kind of comes from, uh, you know, your days uh, in the hood. Uh, when you be dissing on somebody, that's, you're doing them bad, and uh, uh, dyspnea is bad or difficult breathing. Uh, tachy, uh, it's not probably what most people with no medical knowledge think. Uh, it's not, it's not uh, you know, gaudy. It's actually quick, uh, like tachyometer uh, that you have in your car. So tachypnea is fast breathing. And then sometimes we have suffixes that help indicate a certain condition. And in the case of uh, our friend Arthur uh, for joint, itis means inflammation. So we have an inflammation of the joints uh, or hemo. Uh, or hemophile, uh, EAC, uh, meaning it's a bleeding disorder. So, um, and then a lot of times they'll also be a compound of two or more words. So smallpox. Um, I mean, it's not a. In, in general, it's uh, it's not a difficult or complicated old word. It's just a a, a pretty simple uh, union of them. So again, uh, there's tacky again. Uh, tachy is, uh, like I said, fast. Remember, like tachyometer or tachometer. Uh, and then cardia. Well, most of us can probably figure out cardia. That has to do with heart, such as cardiac. Uh, so tachycardia uh, is a fast heart or fast heart rate uh, in this uh, example. Um, you can you can do this with a with a lot of different systems. Uh, the the tacky and just so you know the converse of tacky is brady. Um, brady is slow. Tacky is fast. We can use tachycardia or bradycardia to mean fast or slow heart rates, uh, respectively. You can use it with uh, pnea, so you can have fast or you can have slow breathing with tachypnea or bradypnea. Um, but we also sometimes will throw other terms in there that might throw you off, like hyper, uh, hyperipnea. Uh, hyperipnea is actually f heavy breathing. So uh, they're not always interchangeable. What might uh, look like from the face, uh, no, oh, well, you know, hyperipnea and tachypnea has got to be the same. Uh, they're not technically. <clears throat> hemo and thorax. Hemo meaning blood, thorax obviously the chest. Uh, you have blood in the chest, um, and in this case, uh, I mean, it should be pretty obvious that you have blood in your chest. That's where your heart's at, and in this case, it's free blood uh, in the chest, so it's blood outside of areas in which it should be. So, cardiology, or cardiologist, uh, cardiologist is a Cardio being heart, ology, study, like biology is the study of living things, and ist, meaning special ist, so a heart specialist, uh, like cardiologist. We also get acronyms. We love acronyms in EMS. We love acronyms. We love um, abbreviations. So uh, there is a number of... Uh, to back up to your kind of your root words, um, you've got a couple of them listed in your textbook. <clears throat> a lot of these you're going to actually do better as you go along and move along um, studying the uh, key terms in the chapter. Um, so that should help out. Now, back to acronyms and abbreviations. Acronyms, uh, we have um, 
the words. We, we basically take their initials, and we sometimes will pronounce them as a word, uh, such as CPAP that they have shown here. Uh, CPAP actually it is uh, the abbreviations for continuous positive airway pressure. Um, people with sleep apnea often will sleep with a CPAP on at night. Um, there's all kinds of those that we use in EMS. We use sample. Sample will be one that you're learning here very soon, and it's it's big. Uh, the sample history, S-A-M-P-L-E, which stands for signs or symptoms, allergies, medications, pertinent past medical history, last oral intake, and events leading up. Uh, that's uh, the, the basis of our history taking in EMS. So we have lots of those acronyms that we, we like to use. Um, abbreviations, on the other hand, these are letters or symbols used in places of words or phrases usually to help shorten things up. Um, and in this case, DNR, um, do not resuscitate. We talked about that in the last chapter. We use tons of these. Now, with that being said, you need to know what those mean. You need to know what medical terms mean. You need to know what the abbreviations mean. And you need to know what is appropriate to use for those abbreviations before you go about using them. So if you are not completely sure what a medical term means, you should probably not use it. And it is okay to use plain English to describe specific words, uh, specific uh, things, that's conditions, or problems that you see. If you don't know what a tension pneumothorax is for sure, you maybe should not use it. Or you don't know what um, Crohn's disease is, then don't use it. Some, sometimes we do, sometimes we don't. There's a lot that we don't learn about in EMS that we'll see pop up. So if we don't know much about it, we should probably leave it alone. Um, abbreviations. There are variations of abbreviations all over the world, and um, they're not necessarily standardized, and this is a problem. We used to use a lot of 10 codes in EMS, so we'd say 10.4, 10.8, 10.97, 10.23, um, you know, all kinds of different 10 codes. Those have basically been thrown away by FEMA uh, in the wake of 9-11, uh, really, because they're not standard. Um, a 1045 in Nebraska means a personal vehicle accident. 1045 in Iowa means an animal carcass in the road. So they are not the same across state lines. Some of them are. 104 is pretty universal, but most of them are not. So abbreviations. Know what is acceptable, usable abbreviations. I'll give you a good example. Nitroglycerin. Um, I've seen nitroglycerin abbreviated TNG, NTG, and GNT. Um, the most commonly used version of nitroglycerin is NTG. Uh, but, again, depending on where you went to school, depending on where you worked, it's going to probably influence the way that you use certain abbreviations. If you're not familiar with it, don't use it. Um, if you uh, are not sure if it's an acceptable abbreviation in your system, you should ask. Each system should have an approved abbreviations list. All right, so when, if you go to the non-recorded version of this, you can play the, uh, the medical term components video. Um, in reality, uh, I think you're going to benefit the most out of going to uh, those resources that are shown in your course page that talks about uh, the various uh, medical terminology uh, courses and, and supplements. There's another one uh, about specific medical specialties and knowing uh, what is what and who deals with who. But to move forward, uh, we will move with uh, anatomy and physiology. So. Here's some more medical terms, anatomy and physiology. What do these mean? Anatomy is the study of structure, and physiology is the study of function. And usually they go hand in hand. Um, some schools will choose to have you take two semesters of anatomy and physiology, and it's all basically packaged together. Uh, you'll spend uh, one semester studying three or four body systems, or four or five body systems, and another semester spent you know, will be spent uh, looking at the other three to five body systems. Um, whereas 
some places you'll study a semester of anatomy where you study nothing but the structure and then you'll turn around the next semester and study physiology uh, which is nothing but the function so it's uh, it all depends on the school of thought and where you go but uh, we generally refer to them together because they work together so you might as well learn them together so a few anatomical terms so we're still uh, harping away on some of this terminology in this chapter uh, you will be picking up lots of little body, lots of little uh, pieces and parts of words that you can use in your uh, studies. So anatomical position. This man in the video or the uh, slides is in the anatomic position. Uh, this is the normal position, the body in its least stressed position. So muscles are not crossed, uh, bones are not uh, crossed. So uh, this is the least stressing uh, position for the body to be in. Um, and so it's uh, looking face forward, obviously feet pointed forward, and the palms pointing forward. Uh, and that's what we refer to as an uh, anatomic position. Uh, some generalized um, body terms that go along with that. Uh, the head, uh, the head itself, we have uh, composed mostly of two components, the, the cranium and the facial bones. They mark out mandible there. Mandible usually gets put in with the facial bones, but uh, anything that surrounds the brain is cranium and all that other pretty stuff on the front, basically underneath the, uh, the eyebrows, uh, is facial. So We have the upper extremity going with the shoulder, the arm, the elbow, the forearm, the wrist and the hand. And then we have the lower extremity, which is the thigh, the knee, the leg, which often gets called the lower leg, but it's the leg itself, uh, the ankle and the foot, the torso, uh, or uh, which is the, the core of the body, obviously. And that has the thorax, which is the chest, uh, or everything above the diaphragm. The abdomen is the things below the diaphragm down to the pelvic bowl. And then you have the pelvis, uh, which is uh, everything in between the hip bones and you know in the bowl that, that forms there from those. <clears throat> All right, so some anatomical planes. Uh, we use a number of planes and then a, a number of uh, uh, descriptor positions. Um, so the planes that we're particularly uh, interested in is the mid-axillary plane. Uh, which you see in a, uh, a dotted line that goes uh, through the sideways guy. Mid axle. Axilla is your armpit. So midway through the armpit, that's basically cutting you into a front and back half. We also have the sagittal plane or the mid sagittal plane, which cuts you basically between the eyes, through the nose, down through the breastbone, through your umbilicus, and all your giblets. Um, and that will cut you into right and left halves. Uh, another plane that uh, isn't um, marked on this one, but if we would make a cut across your body, so let's say we cut you through your waist and cut you into a top and bottom half, uh, would be the transverse plane. So um, the mid-axillary plane creates, uh, it's sometimes also called the frontal or coronal, um, and then the, uh, the midline or the medial uh, plane would sometimes also be referred to as the sagittal planes. So. Um, we don't often use the planes in EMS, but to have an idea of which is which uh, is probably a pretty good idea. Additionally, uh, we have a couple of other terms that we need to use here. Um, right and left, uh, as plain as you may think they are, uh, and easy. Uh, the right and the left, when we say right and left regarding a patient, it is that patient's right and left. So if you are standing behind a patient, looking at the back of the patient's head, uh, then your right and their right is the same. But that's pretty rare for us to stand in that position with the, in, in uh, conjunction with our patient. In most cases, we're looking at them face to face, and if we're doing that, it's backwards to us. So our right is their left, their left is our right. So use the patient's right and left. That's what, uh, uh, when we're describing something uh, that's that's the correct way to do that. Uh, a couple other positions we look over on the uh, the right side there. 
um, we have anterior posterior, I'm sorry, left side, anterior and posterior, uh, very up at the very top of that guy, uh, top of that T there. Anterior is the front, posterior is the back. Uh, these are the terms that are generally used with animals that walk erect, which is mostly us. Uh, but anterior and posterior are the general terms used for uh, front and back. Um, if you uh, have ever been out uh, having a chat with somebody in the yard and you maybe leaned, leaned up against a fence post uh, or a light post to uh, have a chat, uh, you put your post here against the post. Uh, most of us wouldn't put our anterior against the post. So, or otherwise, the A comes before the P as you're walking along. Uh, the other terms that sometimes get used here are ventral and dorsal. Um, if you think about a shark, the biggest, uh, most uh, identifying feature of a shark is its dorsal fin uh, when you see it in the water. So it's got that fin sticking out of the water. That dorsal fin is on its back. That should help you remember the dorsal uh, surface of the patient is their back. The ventral surface is their front. In addition to those, <clears throat> upward and downward, uh, when we refer to the patient, uh, towards the head is superior, towards the feet is inferior, not to be confused with proximal and distal. Um, but if you have the superior uh, portion of the femur, would mean up by the hip, as opposed to the inferior portion of the femur. Or the big ones that we use this on, superior and inferior vena cava. The vena cava is the largest veins in the body. There's actually two of them that come together at the heart. The superior vena cava brings blood back from the top half of the body, and the inferior vena cava brings blood back from the lower half of the body. When we look at the uh, right side of the picture here, a couple other terms. I mentioned proximal and distal. Um, this, these can actually kind of uh, be used very loosely and can be very confusing. Proximal and distal get used in when you are describing something in comparison to something else. So let's take the elbow, for example. If you look in the picture, is the elbow distal or is the elbow proximal? Well, that depends on the point of reference. Um, you know, you see that there's a big uh, a gap in there. And like, oh, well, it, it's neither. Well, actually, it's both. If we say, well, my elbow is more proximal than my wrist, but it is also more distal than my shoulder. So it depends on what you're comparing it to. You could say the distal femur or the proximal femur, distal femur being down towards the knee or the proximal femur being up towards the hip. That's probably more appropriate than superior or inferior, but either one would work in this case. Um, when you're saying um, when you're when you're referring to multiple things, you usually will use distal and proximal. Uh, we have midline obviously marked on there, midclavicular, and their the points there are not in the right spot. Uh, they need to be further out to the sides. But the midclavicular means midpoint on the clavicle, and typically midpoint on the clavicle and midpoint on this guy, midclavicular on this guy, would be directly above the nipple on the collarbone. So midclavicular cuts your collarbone in half. Your collarbone goes from the just on the, in, the, you know, the front edge of your shoulder uh, to right at the base of your neck. There's a little notch and there's a bump on either side of that notch um, and that's the, the length of your clavicle. Cut that in half and it gets you to right about where the nipple is or should normally reside. Medial and lateral. Medial and lateral get used uh, quite a bit. Um, medial, if you're driving down the interstate, there's a median, and where is the median? It's in the middle. It's between the two lanes. So medial is in the middle, towards the middle. Lateral, in football, if you lateral, then you throw the ball out to the side. So lateral is outwards towards the side. So medial versus lateral. You may have a medial malleolus and a lateral malleolus, uh, both of those being parts of uh, the ankle. You have a medial and a, and a lateral malleolus. And the lateral malleolus is uh, the outside of your ankle, medial malleolus the inside. And then uh, dorsal and palmar and uh, 
one more we'll put we'll put in there um, the uh, no. uh, palmer is the palm side of the uh, hand so what we're looking at on this picture is the palmer surface uh, plantar if you've heard of plantar fasciitis um, or plantar warts those are have to do with the bottom of the foot so the surface of the foot that walks uh, is the plantar surface uh, dorsal foot um, whereas they're kind of like well you know um, dorsal we said is the back well in the case of the foot uh, the dorsal surface of the foot is actually also the top source uh, surface of the foot so that one is probably why we use dorsal a little less in EMS and more anterior posterior so in this case that, that would not be a posterior portion of his foot so we also divide the abdomen up. Uh, we divide the abdomen into about four quadrants. Uh, it may be depending on where you, uh, how far into e into healthcare you are. They're, they will also divide it into nine different sections, but for our purposes, four works. Uh, and those four sections of the of the abdomen basically uses the umbilicus or the belly button uh, for uh, the dividing points. If you divide it up and down through the belly button. Uh, you get right and left. Of course, it's patients left and right. And if you ha draw a, uh, a horizontal line through the navel, uh, you get the upper and lower. So we have left upper, right upper, left lower, right lower. Uh, and that's a, a pretty standardized abbreviation that you see there uh, for those. So we'll, co we'll cover the content of that uh, uh, here shortly. So some positional terms and how do these uh, pertain to EMS? Supine. Uh, supine is laying flat on your back, looking upward. Uh, that is supine. Um, in many cases, we have patients um, in the supine position. We want to put them on a backboard or we might find them laying on the floor. We have prone. Prone, occasionally we find patients in. We rarely transport patients prone, but the prone position is actually laying on your your belly and your chest, laying uh, face face down. Um, sometimes their face actually is also pointed the same direction. Uh, not usually a good position for transport. We'll find patients that way. Uh, if you're a shooter, you know that there's a, uh, sometimes you'll shoot from the prone position, which is laying on your belly. We have what's referred to as the recovery position. You should have learned about this during your CPR course. Uh, and the recovery position is basically propped up on their left side normally. Uh, you could put them on their right side, but normally on their left side. And they'll usually have you put an arm, their arm, underneath their head to kind of give it some support. Uh, this way, if they're unconscious, they vomit. The vomit can drain out um, and, until we can grab the suction and, and help take care of the rest of it. Uh, you can also kick a knee out uh, to help kind of support them as another kickstand. Uh, there's a couple different different uh, variations on that. Fowler versus semi-fowler. Uh, Fowler's position or high Fowler's uh, is up at uh, almost a 90 degree angle or what we often will refer to as the sitting position. Um, so when they're sitting uh, straight up, uh, bolt upright. The semi-fowler's position though, uh, we typically will put them um, in a, about a 45 to 60 degree angle uh, to accommodate that. And uh, in most cases, that's a uh, comfortable position for patients to be in. So, or semi-sitting. Fowler sitting upright, semi-fowler is semi-sitting. Trendelenburg, and this is actually a misnomer on here. Uh, Trendelenburg technically is feet up, head down. Uh, this is actually what is referred to as shock position, and shock position is feet elevated. However, the core or the torso of the body laying flat uh, or supine with your feet elevated. Uh, so this is technically shock position. Uh, Trendelenburg, the body is actually in a straight line. It's not curved at the waist. Uh, they'll use Trendelenburg occasionally in the hospitals. Um, another uh, 
term that you can use here uh, in body positioning is uh, lateral recumbent, and sometimes they'll use that in place of the recovery position. But lateral recumbent uh, is lying on either side. So you can say left lateral recumbent, they're laying on their left side, or right lateral recumbent, they're laying on their right side. Um, there's all kinds of other ones. There's the knee chest position. We'll talk about that when we get to the OB uh, chapter. Um, sometimes the, they'll refer to things such as lithotomy position, which is not used really in EMS. Um, so, uh, and sometimes we find them in a fetal position where they're, they're kind of curled up in a ball, usually laying on their side. So. All right, so let's talk some body systems. Musculoskeletal system, and this is actually two systems in one. The musculoskeletal system uh, basically is the skeleton or the bones and the cartilage that go along with the bones working in conjunction with the muscular, muscle, muscle system uh, or muscular system and uh, the muscles, the tendons, and the ligaments um, are composed, uh, are, are part of that, and uh, the musculoskeletal system together gives the body shape, it protects organs, and allows for movement. There are other things that this system does. Uh, for example, uh, the, the bone marrow uh, creates blood. Uh, it also, when that, with that bone marrow being also red, red blood cells, but white cells as well. So it also helps with uh, immunity. The, uh, the use of the muscle system, musculoskeletal system, um, creates heat. So it helps to keep the body warm. It also works as a, uh, a padding uh, system uh, or a uh, insulating system to keep some of that heat in. So to break it off, the skeletal system, this extends into basically all parts of the body. Um, it consists of the skull, the spine, the ribs, the sternum, the shoulders, the upper extremities, pelvis, and the lower extremities. Um, and as we, we look at uh, these individual parts, um, we'll identify some various names. Now understand, there are 206 bones in the average adult human body. Each bone has an actual name. and each little characteristic or feature on that bone has a name, whether it's a divot or a hole or a groove or a protruding part of it. Um, they all have little names. Um, and uh, it, it, it's pretty amazing uh, what each one of these little things just has its own name. Um, that's, I guess, why you have doctors of science uh, in anatomy that uh, study all of this. So obviously it extends all parts of the body. When we talk about the, uh, the skeleton uh, before, uh, I step much further into this. Um, I'm going to uh, refer to a term that doesn't uh, really show up in the textbook here. But uh, the axial and the appendicular skeleton. The axial skeleton is the core of the body. So if we go back here, um, the things, and you can actually see it, I guess, they, uh, if you look at this picture, uh, you can see this picture on the slide, there's yellow bones and there's pink bones. Uh, the yellow bones are the axial skeleton or the uh, primary core of the body. The appendicular skeleton is those in pink, so that's the shoulder girdles, the arms, the pelvic girdle, and the legs, and associated structures, of course. Um, and uh, those are the, that's the major division in the skeletal system. Things that are required to live and the things that make living a little nicer. So, the skull. Now, there is a, uh, a large number of bones in the skull. Uh, most of them are not listed here. Um, in fact, uh, the cranium that they refer to here in blue uh, is composed of uh, several bones uh, between the frontal bone on the very front occipital bone on the very back, temporal bones, parietal bones, uh, and there's two of each of those. There's some in the floor of the cranium. Um, obviously, part of it makes up the, the orbit of the eye. So the cranium, again, is the vault that holds the brain. The zygomatic bones or the cheekbones, uh, those are the ones that uh, form the, uh, the structures of the cheek. Um, actually, part of your mandible comes up underneath that zygomatic bone and kind of fits into a little uh, groove. 
the maxilla is the upper jaw uh, that also extends in part of the cheek and into the nose a bit. You've got the nasal bones at the bridge of the nose. You've got some very small bones inside the nose, uh, one of them called the vomer, which is nearly paper thin. Um, and then, uh, yeah, so, and then like I said, most of those bones have, or almost all of those bones, not most, um, all of those bones have grooves and divots and, and all kinds of things on there that have different names. Now there's a variety of other bones that, you, that uh, if you dive deeper into anatomy and physiology that you'll find out about. In fact, the six smallest bones in the human body um, are uh, found within the skull, and those are found uh, three in each ear. So we have the spinal column. Uh, the spinal column uh, provides structure and support uh, for the body, and it houses and protects the spinal cord. Uh, it consists of 33 vertebrae and five separate sections. Uh, the cervical, thoracic, lumbar, sacral, and coccyx. Um, and then the cervical and lumbar regions uh, are the easy, most easily injured. Um, the thoracic vertebrae, while they're not as big as the lumbar vertebrae, have support structures attached to each one of them. So there are 12 thoracic vertebrae that coincide with the 12 sets of ribs you have. So there's a little bit more rigid structure there. Now, how do you remember the number of vertebrae there is? Um, I like to start at the top and think of it as I'm dialing for information in Western Iowa. So if you were to dial information in Western Iowa, you would dial 712555. Um, or in this case, we're going to almost dial it, so 554. Um, there are seven cervical vertebrae. There are one, two, 12 thoracic vertebrae. There are five lumbar vertebrae. There are five sacral vertebrae. And there are roughly three to four to five cosageal vertebrae. We generally will say it's four. Uh, the sacral and coccyx uh, vertebrae are fused. Um, so you can see the, the sacrum looks like a big shield. Um, they're fused together, whereas um, the cervical, thoracic, and lumbar work pretty well independently. Uh, uh, they're not fused to one another unless uh, that's happened um, uh, surgically. So your spinal cord goes down, if you will look at uh, the picture here, to about that second lumbar vertebrae. So that kind of peachy color under the purple color, purple color is the thoracic, the peachy color or orangey color underneath the lumbar, or underneath the thoracic there, the lumbar section, that second one down, uh, just, uh, just north of where his thumbs are, I guess, uh, is uh, about where the end of the spinal cord is. Now there are a variety of other nerves that keep branching off and going south, but the spinal cord stops right around that second lumbar vertebrae. If we look in the thoracic cavity, yes, this is a real picture of a real live dead body. Um, the uh, uh, breastplate has been removed here, as well as some of the protective tissue that would normally be found over uh, these uh, structures. Um, now, when they're, they're showing us this picture, uh, they're kind of showing us more than just musculoskeletal, uh, but the thoracic cavity to help you get a better idea of it here is really what they're they're shooting for. So you can look and see right down the middle of it, there is uh, uh, some tissue there that helps divide us into left and right uh, halves. Um, along the bottom down here, we have the diaphragm, which is the primary muscle of respiration. The walls of the chest, and they have ribs cut. You can see rib. That's part of a rib. That's part of a rib. Rib. Um, you can see them over here as well. Rib. Rib. Uh, part of a rib. Part of a rib. Part of a rib. So the ribs will help form uh, the major walls of the thoracic cavity. And then once you get up to the top, right up about to the collarbones, uh, is about the top of your thoracic cavity. So. Um, the bones of the chest uh, really are the, the 12 pair of ribs, the 12 thoracic vertebrae, um, and uh, of those ribs, uh, 10 of those actually attach to the sternum either directly or indirectly, and the bottom two sets of ribs actually float. They don't attach to the um, sternum itself. So if you would look at 
Uh, let's see, the page 101 doesn't do a very good job of showing it. Um, let's see if we can. If you look on uh, 107, they have a, a appendicular, or a, an axial skeleton there. And if you look at the, uh, look close at the bottom ribs there, you see that they're, they're actually floating free. They're not attached. So uh, those are actually to kind of help protect the kidneys and a little bit around the spleen and part of the uh, liver. We work our way down to the pelvis. Uh, the pelvis obviously is a bony structure. It's a bony ring. Um, it is uh, fused in the middle at the uh, symphysis pubis, um, which actually will uh, separate a bit when a woman gives birth vaginally. The um, bones uh, that make up the pelvis, uh, part of it is the spine and the sacral vertebrae, but we have the ilium, which are your major hip bones. Um, you have the ischium, which are kind of your I like to refer to them as your butt bones. Uh, when you've been sitting there for too long and your butt hurts, uh, it's usually because uh, you've been sitting on that ischium a little bit. Uh, the heads of the femurs, which fit into little uh, divots called acetabula. And um, you know the femoral, uh, femoral heads obviously fit in there. And that's uh, the, the majority of what makes up the pelvis. Interesting thing about the, the bones of the pelvis, is you cannot break a ring once. If you break a ring, you break it twice. So most people, if they actually break the, the pelvic ring, they will break it in two spots. So interesting little fact. So, um, all right, lower extremities. The lower extremities, uh, the pelvis obviously is the attachment point for these. We've got uh, the femurs. Uh, the femurs are the thigh bones. They're the longest and strongest and heaviest bones in your body. Um, when you break a femur, uh, you've, you've usually been through some trauma, unless you have some sort of a medical condition. Um, so that's the, the femur. Um, below the femur, the major bone of your lower leg is the tibia. There's a tibia and a fibula. Uh, oftentimes people will mispronounce those. The tibia is your shin bone. If you take your hand and you run it down below your kneecap, you've got that nice hard ridge usually. That, that's the tibia. There's really only one part or one place on your body that you can touch your fibula and that's right at and above the uh, outside of your ankle at the um, lateral malleolus. The rest of that is usually encased in muscle down there. Um, you can uh, survive just fine without a fibula. In fact, people do. Uh, the fibula uh, just kind of assists the uh, the tibia and, and and the foot actually, and their uh, structure and function. Now, between the femur and the tibia, you have the patella, which is your kneecap. Uh, interestingly enough, babies do not have patella. Uh, patella is something called a sesamoid bone. Um, it actually starts to grow in the middle of a tendon and uh, becomes a bone before adulthood, obviously. Uh, so the, the patella is just a protective uh, cap over that knee joint uh, cavity area. Uh, you have tarsals. Tarsals are your actual ankle bones, uh, with the exception of your uh, heel, which is your calcaneus. Uh, the calcaneus does technically uh, qualify as a tarsal. But uh, the calcaneus is your heel. And then uh, the rest of those bones uh, up there in the upper part of the foot are the tarsals. Where your foot starts to spread out down towards the toes is the metatarsals. And then the toes themselves are the phalanges. We go to the upper extremities. Um, the upper extremities attached to the body via the, the shoulder girdle, uh, the clavicle, uh, is uh, part of that shoulder girdle, as is the scapula, which are your shoulder blades. Uh, another very hard bone to break. If you break that bone, uh, usually you've been through a, a heck of a ride. Um, there is the uh, the sternum, which is uh, part of the bre it's the breastbone where the uh, um, ribs come together. That doesn't classify as upper extremity, but <clears throat> then when we get uh, the acromion process. The acromion process is the uh, part of the scapula that comes around and kind of protects the uh, shoulder. And uh, it's kind of a little hook. It merges with the, or kind of meets up with the clavicle uh, at the top of the shoulder. 
within that, there's a number of uh, ligaments and tendons and so on uh, that help create kind of a, a socket for the humerus or your upper arm bone uh, to uh, fit in. And then, of course, you have the humerus. You have the uh, elbow, which is actually technically called the olecranon process. Uh, when you hit your, uh, your funny bone or your elbow, you hit your olecranon process. And then you have the radius and the ulna in the forearm. Um, how do you keep track of that? How do you remember which is which? Uh, the, uh, if you would put your, and it's probably kind of uh, counterintuitive, but the radius is on the thumb side. The ulna is on the underside. So that kind of helps. A lot of people think, oh, the ulna is on the thumb side. And that's, that's incorrect. The radius is the thumb side. So um, if you're given a, th a thumbs up, um, the bone on top is the radius, the bone on the bottom, what you rest on the table is the ulna. Those come together to create uh, kind of a little uh, groove for the wrist to sit on. The bones of the wrist themselves are the carpals, and they've cut that off in this slide. Uh, the metacarpals are the ex are the the longer part of your hand that leads out towards your fingers, and then your fingers themselves are the phalanges. Now there's another bone that is not uh, demonstrated on here. To find this bone, um, it's behind the mandible or the jaw, uh, the jaw bone, lower jaw bone. There's a bone that sits up in there It's called the hyoid bone. Uh, the hyoid bone is unique uh, in the fact that it is the only bone in the human body that doesn't articulate or move with uh, any other bone. So all the other bones work together with other bones. Uh, but the hyoid bone, uh, which usually fractures if you uh, hang yourself or you get hung, um, is the only bone that does not. And it is actually the anchor for your tongue. Joints. Lots of different types of joints in the body. Um, these are formed where two bones meet up. Um, there's lots of different types, more than what we show here. Ball and socket joint, the good example they show of the ball and socket joint uh, is the, uh, the femur. Uh, in the head of the femur fitting into the acetabulum, um, or the hinge joint, which in this case uh, it looks like they're trying to uh, indicate that it's the elbow um, for the hinge joint, so the olecranon process there. Those are the two major types of movable joints. We have lots of other joints. We have saddle joints that kind of glide across each other. Um, we have some immovable joints. Uh, in your skull, you have numerous immovable joints once you become an adult. Babies have soft spots because their bones in their skull have to move back and forth uh, to allow them to get out of the birth canal. But after birth, they start to solidify and uh, become um, a, uh, uh, a single sheet of bone. And so those we uh, we will call sutures. And uh, sutures are former movable joints that have become immovable. So there's way more to joints than just what the two they show here. These are the ones that typically uh, give us the most issues when we're dealing with uh, joint injuries. Uh, muscle. We have three types of muscle. Uh, and those muscles uh, protect the body. They give it shape. They allow for some movement. Uh, voluntary muscle uh, or is also called skeletal muscle things that we control via the brain consciously. So if you decide you're going to get up and walk across the room, the majority of that was done by voluntary or skeletal muscle. Um, you also have involuntary muscle or smooth muscle. Almost always the smooth muscles are found in tubes. So anything that's a tube within your body usually is a smooth muscle. You don't have any voluntary control over it. Um, when you do, you might have some sphincters that you can voluntarily move, but for the most part, they kind of do their own thing. So everything from your mouth all the way to your anus is a big chunk of smooth muscle. Um, it's a big tube that moves things uh, straight down. Well, not straight down, I should say. Moves things downwards as it processes and moves it on out. Um, your blood vessels are smooth muscles. And you also have some other rounded uh, smooth muscles in your eyes. 
Um, and then there's a one unique uh, organ that has its own type of muscle tissue, and that's the cardiac muscle tissue or the heart. Um, it is also involuntary, uh, but it has a lot of the, it has more strength like that of a skeletal muscle, but it more closely resembles a smooth muscle. And the, and the cool thing about it is it doesn't rely on anybody else to give it an electrical stimulus to do its thing. It creates its own. So the muscles give us uh, a lot of our movement, our form, protects us, gives us shape, creates a lot of heat for us. Um, so muscles obviously pretty important. Um, and then the blood supply uh, usually is all responsible. Uh, the blood supply comes from the cardiac or cardiovascular system. However, uh, in the case of the cardiac muscle, it supplies its own blood. So. Moving to the next system, which is the respiratory system. And the respiratory system brings oxygen in via inhalation, and it excretes carbon dioxide via exhalation. So inhalation is an active process. Your body has to do work in order to move air in, uh, and it has to naturally relax, or it's a passive process, to exhale out through exhalation. Um, now, the structures of the respiratory system um, include uh, the pharynx, and the pharynx is divided into a couple of different uh, places. Uh, you have the nasal pharynx, or the openings behind your nose. You have the oral pharynx, or the opening behind your mouth. The openings of the nose itself are the nares, um, is what those are officially called the cavity behind there are the respective pharynxes. You also have a laryngopharynx, or what just cut, gets called common pharynx a lot, which is in the back where the two merge uh, and lead all the way down to the epiglottis. Now the epiglottis is uh, the protective cap over the rest of the respiratory tract. Um, I like to, uh, because we live here in the Midwest, people have often seen a tractor get fired up, and when somebody fires up a tractor, uh, what happens? The, uh, the little exhaust or the smokestack on there, uh, little, there's a little, usually a little uh, valve, little cap over the top of that, it'll kick up, and it will remain open as long as the tractor's running. But once you turn the tractor off and there's no exhaust coming out, it'll fall back down and close. Well, that's a tractor epiglottis. Uh, it keeps the wet stuff out of the out of the area in which the uh, the air should be moving back and forth. Actually, in a tractor's case, it's all moving outward. But so now that epiglottis sits on top of the uh, larynx, which is at the top of the trachea, and the trachea is the uh, structure uh, that actually is uh, leading down to the lungs. You have thyroid cartilage, which are part of the uh, structure around the top of the of the trachea there, um, and then uh, the trachea goes down. It splits at the carina into right and left sides, and then you have some main stem bronchi. You get into smaller bronchi and smaller bronchi and smaller bronchi until you get down to what we see in the in the circle there. You have a little bronchiole, or what's called a terminal bronchiole, uh, and it leads to alveoli or the alveolus, which is uh, the air sacs where actually most of the work gets done. And then obviously very important parts here, the diaphragm, um, and then there's other muscles that uh, work along with to help uh, the actual process work. Too many. All right, so we talked about inhalation and, and exhalation. I said inhalation is an active process. It takes the body energy to do that. Um, and when the body decides it's going to take a breath, the diaphragm, the intercostal muscles, which are the muscles between the ribs, they contract. Uh, and uh, so the diaphragm moves down. The intercostal muscles actually pull the chest up and out. And then there is a negative pressure in there or a vacuum inside the chest that draws air in. 
when the body says, okay, that's enough, uh, we've, we've put enough air into the, into the chest, uh, it stops, the exhalation process begins where the diaphragm and the intercostal muscles just relax and return back to their normal positions. That creates positive pressure or, or high pressure in the chest that then pushes that air out. Um, when we get to the airway section uh, of your EMT class here, you will learn that uh, we do positive pressure ventilation uh, on patients who aren't breathing and it's actually the opposite of what their body is used to doing. So it can be kind of difficult for them. So it shows you kind of how uh, inhalation occurs. The diaphragm kind of flattens down. And then exhalation, when that diaphragm goes and it goes back to its normal position, it pushes on the lungs, pushes that extra air out. Two terms that you need to know. These are pretty critical terms to know and often confused terms. Um, ventilation and respiration. Ventilation is the movement of gas in and out, or as they put it here, to and from the alveoli. So ventilation is air moving in and out. Respiration is actual gas exchange between the cells of the body, the bloodstream, and the alveoli, depending on where at in the system you are. So ventilation and respiration. Um, I don't like how in, in medicine we've adopted the, uh, we're going to check your respirations as a vital sign. We should actually be checking their ventilations, because that's all we can really tell from watching their chest move up and down and listening to them breathe, is actually their ventilation, not their respiration. respiration um, it, it takes more than just watching. So ventilation versus respiration. We can do artificial ventilation for somebody, but it's not very easy to do artificial respiration. They can do it in the hospital with something called an ECMO, but we can't do it in the field. So oxygenated blood travels from the lungs to the heart, and then is pumped out to the rest of the body. At the capillary level, uh, oxygen, or O2 is how it's abbreviated, O with a sub 2, uh, is exchanged with the cells for waste products, mostly carbon dioxide, or CO2 with a sub 2, um, as, uh, and that's an appropriate abbreviation, that's the medical, or the, uh, the scientific abbreviation of it, um, are, are exchanged, so the, the body cells are getting the good stuff, which is the oxygen, and it's taking out the trash, which is the CO2. Deoxygenated blood then returns to the heart and to the lungs where the CO2 is pulled from the blood uh, and put back into the lungs and is exhaled out. So that's how the, the whole process, it's just that simple. No, not really. Um, uh, that's how that process works uh, in, a, in a nutshell. Um, please, when you are talking, uh, if you're going to use terminology, you're going to use uh, abbreviations, know the difference between CO and CO2. CO is carbon monoxide, which the body does not make, nor does it handle very well. Um, your furnace makes it, and it will kill you uh, without you knowing. But uh, CO2, which is carbon dioxide, not monoxide, CO2, di, or by, uh, is the body's waste product. So CO2 normal for the body, CO, not normal for the body. So when we look at the respiratory system of a pediatric patient, um, how does it differ from that of an adult? Obviously things are smaller. Um, so when we got smaller openings of the mouth and nose, we have a smaller trachea to deal with. Uh, it's narrower. The chin is uh, less prominent. The head, though, on the back of the head is more prominent. So we have a big back of the head, or occiput is what it's called, and that occiput will push their head forward. So if you look at this picture, um, look at how the child's nose and mouth are in relation to his chest, and then compare that to the adult laying there, where the chin is one of the highest parts on the adult face and it's one of the lowest parts on the child's face. 
So it pushes the head forward. Um, everything is much more flexible in a child than it is in an adult. So if it's not formed, if it hasn't calcified from drinking milk, this is why your kids need to drink their milk, um, it, if it hasn't calcified yet, it's going to be floppy. So the trachea is kind of floppy in a, in a child, and it can be collapsed easy. Um, so it's obviously easier to obstruct these things. You've got a big, giant tongue in that child's mouth. It's really about the only thing that uh, is not proportionately smaller uh, is this giant tongue. Um, now, proportionately, the back of the head is about right. It's just the child hasn't grown into their head. Uh, that's why babies have big, huge heads. Um, it's still a lot of development going on there. So uh, that's some of the major differences that we see respiratory-wise. And I'm going to stop here with this part of the lecture, and I'm going to pick up again with a part two.